Okay, so today we're going to be going over James Burnham's The Managerial Revolution. This is a very good book. Um, I highly recommend reading it. I'd say it's another one of these essential uh, books to read if you're looking into stuff like, well, this is not really elite theory. This is more like political sociology, but nonetheless, it's still a very important book to read. Uh, it is very technical. We're going to go over all of that today, and we're going to try our best to break it down, and hopefully to those who are going to read the book, this could help you. So, you know, let's start out. Basically, he says, all wars, he starts out talking about warfare. So he says, all wars find their justification in man, and typically it is said that war is meant to serve the good and protect the innocent and serve God. World War II, says Burnham, is uh, no different. However, World War II can be considered revolutionary in nature as a, a social revolution was being pushed through the process of this war. He gives us a three-point criteria for knowing when social revolution is going to occur. The first of those points being there is a change in the major social institutions and things like property relations change as well. Uh, some examples uh, of revolutions are the changes from feudal European society to a more merchant-based one. Uh, that's, that's basically the uh, transition from feudalism to capitalism. Uh, and sometimes these institutions are thrown out altogether. The second point here is uh, a cultural shift happens as well, namely that men have a different understanding of who they are, their place in the universe, and things such as uh, churches, schools, uh, well, universities, same thing as schools, those change, those institutions change, the social institutions. The third point is, uh, and then finally, a change in who holds top positions in society. For example, the shift from feudal lords to industrialists and bankers is a uh, is a historical example. So the goal of this book is to describe what he calls the quote unquote managerial revolution and to predict the type of society that will follow from this revolution. He goes on to say that uh, institutions of the major European nations in America have gone on not only to influence the nations they belong to, but also nations outside of themselves. And we all kind of know this, is especially the case in America. America has a heavy influence on European countries and even countries uh, like in South America uh, and in Europe before America was founded was also very influential so I mean this is just kind of a given here modern capitalism uh, the form of society we, we which we live in now has gone through major changes and transformation and has been out of all the economic and social types uh, more fluid and in flux so what he's saying is that capitalism even though it's ex it's existed for relatively short amount of time in comparison to other forms of uh, social organization, but in that short amount of time it has gone through a lot of various changes. So uh, there's also various features of capitalist society, Burnham lists, the first being production of commodities. Capitalism creates commodities of various kinds, and all these commodities can be compared quantitatively via exchange value. All uh, advanced societies have created commodities, but not all of their goods were commodified, however. In capitalism, all of the goods are commodified. Previously, in feudal society, when goods were being exchanged, it wasn't price that determined whether or not one was to choose or obtain something. Rather, it was uh, need and how valuable a certain object was for, for, for fulfilling a need, rather than the abstract price. Uh, need and use was more important in feudal societies and previous societies before that as well. The second point here is... Uh, Money in the capitalist system has a more prominent role in comparison to other systems. Money is the only medium of economic exchange in capitalism, whether it be physical or abstract money, it is still used. This can be contrasted with the Middle Ages and places in the Middle East, where your average person would actually never even see money, ever. Um, the third point here is money plays two big roles in capitalist society, the first being a medium of exchange, and the second being in itself capital or money set out to make more capital, I mean more money. Uh, in feudal society, the latter was looked down upon, especially that of usury, which is the pinnacle of money set out to make more money. So it's kind of a self-referential way of making a profit. So the fourth point here is under capitalism, production is carried out for profit. And this is the case because if an enterprise doesn't make a profit, it will die out. Once again, this can be contrasted with the feudal system in which production was done to feed the workers of a land and provide for the church. The fifth point here is in capitalist society, there are periodic economic crises, and these for the most part do not have their cause in natural disasters. Uh, 
such as famine or drought, but rather in the role of abstract economic forces and relations. Point six, capitalism pro capitalist production is regulated by the market rather than a set group of individuals. The state can have control over the market, but only in certain restricted domains, and even in, in those fields where, where they do have that restricted uh, influence, the, they have very they have a lot of difficulty in succeeding. So that that kind of in a sense shows the uh, state is in a capitalist society is more subordinate to capital than in other societies. So point seven here is capitalism divides people into two groups. The first being those who own the means of production, factories, industry, business, etc. They collect the profit and hire labor. And secondly, those called the proletarian or workers who do the labor for the capitalists and do not own anything related to the business or the means of production. Both these classes need each other to exist. There are no proletarians without the capitalists who have dominion over them and no capitalists to have anyone to profit off uh, off of without the workers. Now, now, he's, now he switches over to speaking of the political institutions of capitalist society. He says, one, nations are no longer determined by biological groupings, which come about through different geographical boundaries. Each state proclaims sovereignty and that it sees no higher authority than itself. The only relation citizens now have to the nation is citizenship to it. This is a contrasted in feudal society where loyalty wasn't given to the nation as an abstract idea, but to a specific person who rules over them, such as a king or a feudal lord or something of that sort. Despite the fact that power, cha uh, power amongst kings was divided up, there still was a strong unity with those who the king ruled over, and the fact that the church ruled over all of Europe, being, uh, which also shows a strong unity of institutions in, feudal, in the feudal time when the church in Europe permeated through all of the kingdoms that were present. So the second point here is capitalist society was the first to have a world extent or global reach. This was because the markets had to venture out to find more opportunities and resources as well as the great powers uh, at the time were, were capitalists. And so when the great powers are a certain way, they're going to naturally influence the rest of the world when they get the opportunity to. Point three, when speaking of a state, we mean the political institutions of society, bureaucracy, uh, government, army, etc. They may vary over time, but overall remain constant. The state would regulate the economy, but not uh, go too far because it would then violate property rights, therefore destroying the capitalist process. So four, political authority must be concentrated in some group or be actualized in some way. Point five, the restriction of the state's activities has no necessary connection with the relation between democracy and capitalism. You can have capitalism limited by the state, which can be a democracy, but it, can't just as e it can just as easily be a dictatorship as well. It must also be said that capitalism and democracy are not the same thing. There have been non-democratic capitalist states and democratic non-capitalist states before. The laws set within a capitalist society exist to hold up the structure and standards of the capitalist system it governs over. He goes on to speak about ideology and says that ideologies can be defined as a system of ideas, hopes, and wishes and that ideologies are often a binding structure for the people of a society. So in a capitalist society, there is often an ideology that comes with it, and it is typically one of individualism. We see this with the propagation of property rights and individual rights, espousing that all individuals have the right to pursue their rights to pleasure. Collective bodies of institutions for capitalist ideology are viewed as mere numeric sums of individuals. As for the individualist, all that exists, ontologically speaking, is the individual. Capitalist society puts pressure on the notion of private initiative to try and bolster the economic process. Uh, the individual in a capitalist society is seen as having the status of being uh, with natural rights and the rights to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Often the definition of these rights are argued over within the capitalist society. So there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of disagreement, philosophically speaking, about what these rights are, but nonetheless they still kind of presuppose them in any capitalist society in order for it to function as such. Point four, sorry, I, I wasn't listing all the points. This is also a point, this is also laid out in points in the book. But anyways, point four, capitalist society replaces the old theological and religious worldview with that of progress and innovation. Of course, this will affect ideology, and there isn't a set ideology in, in capitalist society. And there are many interpretations of what capitalism, capitalism should be. Uh, moving on, he says, 
There are two theories regarding the future of capitalist society. The first being that capitalism will last forever or indefinitely, and that they, uh, and then they're not going to radically be changed at all. The, the second being that capitalist society will be replaced by a socialist society. Burner states that this book seeks to show that capitalism will be replaced by a quote-unquote managerial society. And not only this, but that this transition is already occurring as we speak. And he wrote this book in 1941, so according to his theory, we should be much more further down the road of this process. He points out that the theory that capitalism will remain forever is very rarely expressed explicitly and is often very implicit in what people say and think. The sentiment is based on two assumptions, both of which are false. The first is the assumption that society has always been capitalist and always will be so. This is wrong as capitalism has only existed for a short period of time in all of human history. The second being capitalism has its basis in human nature. This is the second assumption. This is basically the same as the first assumption but expressed slightly differently. The issue of saying that it's human nature to be a capitalist is that human nature has been able to adapt itself to all kinds of living uh, systems created by humans which of course are going to reflect part of their nature. That you, you know, the effect is going to um, reflect the cause. Burnham now provides us with an argument for why capitalism will not continue. So this is a, this is essential here to understanding the rest of this theory. So listen here. Okay, so one, capitalist society creating mass un keeps creating mass unemployment, especially for the youth. Typically, mass unemployment is a symptom that a social organization is on its last legs. If society can't provide roles for its people, it is decaying. Two. It has a common economic crises and instability, such as periods of booms and depression, which is not a stable system to live in. Three, the debt present in capitalist society sucks away the life of capitalism, since all resources are going to be used to pay off debt rather than invest in the society itself. Four, capitalist markets rely on free monetary exchange transactions, which are diminishing. Five, after World War I, in all capitalist nations, there has been an agricultural depression. Agriculture is very important, and no civilization can survive without it, especially capitalist ones with higher population density. Six, capitalists, capitalists sorry, hardly find any use uh, for the available investment funds. In other words, capitalism can much like... It like it can't organize the employment of the masses, it can't, can't any longer organize the employment or movement of investments. Most investments come from the state, not private funds as well, it, it, as, this, as capitalism progresses. This is what's happening. Seven, capitalists can no longer manage the backward um, or less developed nations like it used to when these backward nations were under the dominance of more advanced nations. Eight, Capitalism can can't even in its own technological capabilities um, be efficient anymore. For example, the lack of the ability to develop housing for people, despite the fact that all the resources are ready are ready to hand. If if the capitalists don't use the resources, then basically someone else will. If they're just sitting there. Uh, nine, the bourgeoisie ideologies which help instill the values. Um, and which help maintain the capitalist system and people have become impotent and lazy and people don't really buy them anymore that's also another issue ideologies do not have to be rational or correct for them to work by the way all that must be the case is that these ideologies create a strong enough sentiment in people to keep them tied to the system so now addressing the second alternative to the theory of the managerial revolution is the proletarian socialist revolution this is the belief that a classless Fully democratic and international society will triumph over capitalism, which is the exact opposite of a classless, fully democratic and international society. However, you could have an international capitalist society if you'd like. But there are many varieties of socialism, and they all agree on the end goal of the type of society. However, they may disagree on how to get there, or what they would call praxis. The socialists want a classless society which is to say they want to get rid of distinction between groups of people based on ownership over the means of production. This wasn't the class of society, oh, they want, sorry, rather, they want the class of society to be international, in the end, even if it may have to at first be localized to a few countries. So that's kind of like, you know, you're going to start out with something like the USSR and then eventually it'll spread. That's the goal. 
They want the society to be fully democratic in the sphere of the political, social, and economic. And this will stem from the working class. The spirit of this revolution is latent within the working class, according to thinkers such as Marx. They will usher in a state, which is a dictatorship of the proletariat, and then after some time of reform, the state will dissolve uh, all its entities as well, creating communism. The anarchist socialists believe that the state can't do this, and that the state must be abolished altogether, and then communism can flourish. Both, but both of these theories of socialism, as the previous one we went over, believe that the capitalist society won't last, but for different reasons. And it is a non sequitur to state that because capitalism ceases, uh, that then socialism will triumph. It doesn't necessarily follow from that premise that socialism will triumph. So, the Marxist basis claim on their theory of dialectical materialism, drawn from uh, Hegelianism, but turned materialist instead of, well, Hegel would just call it spirit. But they assert the syllogism that if capitalism, capitalism is not going to last and socialism is the only alternative, then socialism will come. The issue is that the second premise is presupposed without justification. There are various other types of society which, all, which are alter, alternatives to capitalist society, and we can deduce this uh, using probabilities. In our case, Burnham states it's the managerial society. The other assumption is that a classless society is possible when, all throughout history, this hasn't been the case. There has not been one class of society. It's always been hierarchical. Not to mention that production isn't always controlled by certain individuals, but also institutions, and in ancient times this was the priestly class, according to Burnham. The Marxists divide themselves into groups, all claiming to adhere uh, closest to Marx himself. And when one sect of Marxism does something unsatisfactory, they will not claim any responsibility because it is not quote-unquote real Marxism. This tactic often makes it impossible to critique Marxism as a whole, but nonetheless, because they share ideals in common, we can still critique them. Burnham critiques the notion that Bolshevism is an example of a sign that capitalism will be replaced by socialism. The first issue is that Marx, Marx's prediction that socialism will occur in advanced countries is demonstrated false by the Bolshevik Revolution in that Russia was war-torn and backward economically. See, Marx originally predicted that, yeah, it was going to occur in advanced countries. Well, Russia at the time was not an advanced country, and that was where the first socialist, quote-unquote, socialist revolution occurred. So, at the start of the revolution, uh, Russia was closer to socialism, but towards it, towards its more mature stages, it was backed away from the ideas, ideals of an internationalist, classless, fully democratic society. And Burnham is going to claim that it is actually closer to a managerial society, which we're going to see later. Um, they have not even eliminated classes on the basis of economic lines in the USSR. St uh, statistics published in the socialist press uh, demonstrate that the top 11-12% of the Soviet population receive, receives 50% of the national income. So a minority is receiving half of the national income. Therefore, yeah, it is a minority who owns the income, the, uh, half the income. Uh, and while the other 88 to not 89% owns the other 50%. So it's distributed over a larger population size. Uh, so there's an inequality here. Um, however, at the time in the United States, which was a capitalist society, uh, it was only that the upper 10% of society received 35% of the national income. So the Soviet minority wealthy class owned more, um, owned more wealth than the capitalist class in America. Some may object that Trotsky, uh, who these stats came from, by the way, uh, because of his issue with Stalin, fudged these results. But this is wrong because at the time Trotsky was still stubborn in his belief that Russia was a worker-owned and operated country. The Russians assumed, in keeping with line with Marxism, that Russian communism would spread internationally, and that the Russian state was simply the starting point. However, this was not the case at all. All the evidence seems to suggest that the events in Russia run counter to the theory of Marx. To summarize, socialism first took place in an underdeveloped country. The class distinction on economic lines actually spread further than they were previously, the regime did not reach any internationalist in the true sense of the communist revolution. Now, if Russia is not socialist, then well, what is it? Well, as I mentioned before, it's 
It's also obviously not capitalist. It's considered a proto-managerial state. The same, the same society replacing capitalism um, on a world scale is going to be a managerial one, basically. It should also be mentioned that the abolition of private property rights is not a sufficient condition to proclaim that socialism has triumphed as in Russia in 1918, private property was abolished, yet socialism did not come for the reasons mentioned hitherto. Marx also predicted that mass proletarianization of society, which for the Marxist ideal would be perfect as the majority of citizens would be workers and only a handful of capitalists. And this would allow the revolution to occur uh, easier, uh, numerically speaking, because you'd have more proletarian, um, I guess you could say, just more proletarian men who are willing to fight for the revolution. Uh, this has not been the case, however. In all uh, economies, we see an agricultural sector in which those running these sectors are neither worker nor capitalist, in a technical sense, but rather small private producers. This creates what one calls the quote-unquote new middle class. This class is made up of high-ranking individuals within society, such as executives, accountants, bureaucrats, etc. These people are not working class, nor do they run large capitalist enterprises either. So they're not workers, but nor are they owners. They are basically what we would call the managers. The working class since 1914 has actually decreased. The advance of technology and industry has rendered many workers unnecessary, and left society with unskilled workers. Capitalist society also advanced military equipment and to produce things such as um, planes, tanks, ships, etc. require large amounts of skill which most workers can't learn overnight so this displaces the working masses with a more educated class using you know higher grade machinery to produce these weapons of war which only, select them, which only a select minority have the skills to do. On top of all this, no workers' revolution can take off as the military becomes more advanced. The workers do not have access to high-caliber weaponry and can't fight back. The Marxist uh, parties go out of fashion as well, and they die out quickly in many countries. And in countries where fascism is present, they surrender quickly or get absorbed into the fascist party. The Marxist ideology has been very influential in that it has described itself as the only scientific explanation of society, on top of that, the socialists have only been able to keep their power so long as they cease to remain being socialists in principle. Once power is obtained, the goal for all regimes independent of ideology is to focus on the pragmatics and maintaining their power. Idealism fades away, and that goes right back to Michel's again. Uh, ideology, ideologies only work to sway the masses so long as they appeal to them, but Marxism no longer appeals to the masses because their needs have transcended that of the Marxist ideology, and part of that has to do with the fact that there's less people in the working class today. In all societies, goods are social in character, which is to say that no one individual typically creates their own goods, and the goods they obtain take a process which require many individuals to produce. For example, your bread at the market requires the baker, who require, requires the farmer, and then the person who packages the bread for you. So there's multiple people um, creating this unity of production to provide a single product for you. Burnham is concerned with who controls the process of production, but not necessarily who owns it. These means of production are always set by limitations, such as the fact that not all people have access to them and to control them, and also... Uh, what exactly they produce. All societies um, have a ruling class who are defined by those who have power, privilege, and access to wealth. Those who control access to production grant themselves access to more wealth over time. It should be noted that controlling the means of production is not the same as what Burnham calls quote-unquote preferential treatment or income. However, the two often go hand in hand. In feudal society, for instance, it was the lords over agriculture who control the access to production, and therefore, they were the ruling class. Whoever controls the industry and manages it, manages it has the power of being the ruling class. That is the standard here. In modern times, that is a class of the bourgeoisie who control the means of production, and the state power helps back this up within a society by enforcing the rights of this ruling class. The ruling class is never contingent upon the specific individuals who make it up. As this changes, it is, uh, changes it is contingent upon who controls the access to the means or instruments of production. The question arises, however, uh, how do we shift? 
how do we shift from a feudal run society to a capitalist run society? The answer is more complicated than the capitalists just got together and fought the feudal lords. This comes down to two factors, really. Wars which broke down lords, the, the feudal lords, that is, and the new ideologies which replaced and broke the moral fabric of feudalism uh, and created new attitudes towards the bourgeoisie structure, a.k.a. the capitalists. The capitalists didn't do the fighting or the thinking, uh, honestly. They just financed those who would do this. And this would generate more support as the people fighting these wars uh, are getting monetary rewards. And also the people creating the ideologies are also getting supported in some way, I'd assume, as well. The fighting was done by mercenaries who, being financed by these capitalists, had the ability to obtain new technologies such as guns, gunpowder, and this took out uh, knights very quickly because they were just more advanced than them because they invested in their mercenaries more. Also, the workers and uh, the poor peasants had been brought into this fight as well. It is a mistake to think that all capitalists fought together as one monolith financing these armies because they fought against each other as well. As often, the interest is more powerful than a class. Uh, the uh, human interest, that is, is more powerful than just the class interest as a whole. Self-interest. These wars helped the capitalists and the people fighting them thought it would help them, but it did not really do as much uh, as it helped with the capitalists. So, it, yeah, it was, they thought it was going to trickle down, but that didn't actually happen. The ideologies promoted by the bourgeoisie did not explicitly say that they were bourgeoisie. Uh, this was um, best for them because you you know you want to have these ideologies be more implicit. Uh, so the, the lower classes in society believed in these things and they thought they were the universal truth, as all ideologies proclaim themselves to be. The proletarians can never have pulled off what the bourgeoisie did, as they don't have the, res the uh, resources to push a social revolution and also a militaristic one like the bourgeoisie did. At most, they can have an ideological movement. They're not going to be as advanced as the bourgeoisie movements. Trade unions do not work either as they presuppose capitalist relations, economically speaking, to begin with. Uh, they just get you a little more freedom in the existing structure, so they don't really do that much. The next step of the bourgeoisie revolution was to take over the state in the sense that the state now adjusts legality to their benefit. We see this reflected in that kings, who, at, the, at this time, didn't have much political power in comparison to feudal lords. Uh, they wanted to centralize their power, and the capitalists wanted this as well because once power is centralized, they have a state to back their trade routes and protect them. So the capitalists will support regal centralization because that creates a state for their benefit. The question also arises as to where the early capitalists came from. People who, uh, like adventurers, became capitalists. Um, this was like the age of exploration. This kind of led to a lot of that. Uh, as they got more successful in their campaigns, artisans became capitalists. Um, when they started hiring workers for wages, <coughs> excuse me, merchant shippers were the big capitalists at the time. Some came from the previous ruling class. Some lords became capitalists because they uh, drove serfs off their land and engaged in a landlord style of behavior. The previous ruling class of the feudal lords gets absorbed into the new ruling class of the bourgeoisie capitalists. Now Burnham finally introduces the theory of the managerial revolution. Once again, this is a transition from the bourgeoisie or capitalist society to that of the ma managerial society. Thus, this transition changes the institutions from capitalist dominated to managerial dominated. The start of this transition can be placed back to the First World War, and within 50 years from that point, it should be complete. Uh, well, it's been a lot longer than that, and it's, I would say it's not complete, but it is kind of holding up in a, in a very accurate way. But anyway, the managers desire to achieve social dominance and become the new ruling class. This is the case. Uh, for all people who want to become the ruling class, and they will be successful in becoming the new ruling class. Unlike other classes, the ruling class of the managerial elite will not have, will not own the instruments of production, and no individuals of that class will either. The state will own these instruments of production, and the managers will control the state, so they indirectly get to have uh, ever more influence over the instruments of production. 
So it's more of a set of people, like a set class controlling the production. The only thing the, ma uh, the managers will quote unquote own will be certain institutions within the state that will help promote their control over the instruments of production. Instruments of production, by the way, is the same thing as the means of production. This is very similar to the state supporting rights uh, surrounding property for the bourgeoisie. However, according to Burnham, there has not been any coherent ideologies produced to help bind the masses into supporting the managers quite yet. There are, however, proto-managerial ideologies which we have seen pop up, fascism and national socialism, uh, Leninism, Stalinism. Remember, by the Marxian definition, they aren't truly socialist or truly communist yet. Uh, and finally, American New Dealism. Actually, I should let me go back here. They also, by the Marxist definition, they aren't truly socialist, as their as the classes still did exist uh, in the in the socialist in the quote unquote socialist states. New ideologies will be formed, and once again, the managers aren't plotting this out collectively. This is just a natural expression of their self interest that all classes have unconsciously. Those working for the managers will think that they are working for their own good. And the intellectuals which develop the ideologies for the managers will think that they are describing their ideal society, but at the same time, it benefits these managers. Now, this always happens. There's, there's always a lower class that supports the higher class without realizing it. This revolution is already occurring as we speak, and it is not something we are waiting uh, to happen. Uh, it is, it's just something that it hasn't been fully realized yet. Now, Burnham tells us more about who these managers really are. The first answer is that whoever is managing the means of production, whoever has control over this, has class privilege. At first, it was the capitalists who did the managing of the means of production, but eventually this became too much to handle as industry grew. Um, when products are being made, especially complex technical products such as planes or ships, you need, to, you need skilled labor. And you need uh, many skilled workers. You would also need a scientist, an engineer and someone who will actually build the objects as well. You also need someone to organize the flow of production so things get done on time, and these groups of people will be called the managers. Professions which are managerial are things such as operating executives, supervisory technicians, superintendents, etc., and in government, administration, uh, and government uh, administrators, bureau heads, commissioners, and probably other, a bunch of various uh, professions as well exist now that didn't at the time. Now all managers belong to the same class, but not all of them are to the same degree uh, in terms of status. Some, some are lesser, some are higher in, in their terms of social status. Industry didn't always require the managers uh, in a more primitive society when the industry was smaller. Uh, those doing the work could manage the flow of production and also the capitalists themselves could manage the um, the production because they're, they're more invested in the in their own industry by invested I mean their own time and will into it even in early capitalism there didn't exist like I said the exist the managers for the skills of labor needed were not so as diverse and there weren't as many people doing different things within industry there are various interest groups involved in industry as well such as stockholders managers owners and workers the stockholders don't contribute much, just a sum of investment to help the business, but the managers are more needed as nothing can happen without them. So they can expand their power into other interest groups and manage them, thus expanding their managerial power overall. The reason this is the case is because of a sociological law, which is that all groups have some sort of power or privilege seek to make all groups that have power or privilege seek to maintain this power and privilege, but more importantly, expand it. Like we mentioned in my video on De Juvenal, he always says power wants to find a way to expand. That's a, a, a law of it. When one faction of these competing powers becomes successful, it is usually a net negative for the other factions as their power has uh, diminished. There's no room for their power as other ones grow. In periods of prosperity and peace, usually these factions, capitalists, managers, stockholders, etc., do not have to compete with one another, but these periods are usually only in the early stages of capitalism and are no longer present, so competition for power uh, is present between them. The power of the capitalists lies uh, within their ownership of private property, and if this disappears, so does their power. The manager's power transcends ownership, so if the capitalist loses ownership, it is not a big deal, as their sole, sole source of power is to manage production. Whoever owns the means is irrelevant. 
The stockholders, however, do have something to lose if the capitalists lose ownership, because now they don't, you know, they cannot have a share of the profit if the people who own the profit is is gone. Then their profit is gone. Unemployment is an issue for capitalists, because that is how their wealth is generated. For the managers, this is actually very easy, uh, a very easy issue to solve. All they have to do is expand their technical coordination and industry, which is to say they will get more people to develop products by increasing the need for more people to create these products in the industry itself and appointing to people, and appointing people to different positions to make the production process even more efficient so they can reorganize the industry, expand the industry to get more people involved. The capitalists can't do this. They're not as skilled in that sense. What determines who the ruling class is is that group has control over the ability to access power and has control over and, and obviously controls what it is they have power over. Uh, these two are linked as you uh, cannot have control over something if you do not have control over the access to it. In industry, uh, it is also linked. You, you know, you must first have control over the means of production, and then from here, you must you, you have control over the distribution of its products. Once you have control over access to the means of production, then you have control over the distribution of the products, and this is how one class can replace another. Thus, we have the managerial revolution, as the, manager, as the managers have control over the means and determine how they get used over time. They can replace the capitalist class because they have more access to the means of production, and they're more, you know, they're more involved with it, and thus they begin to have more privilege over the distribution of the products. Now we see how the managers move toward more social dominance. The obvious objection is brought up uh, that these managers are just servants of the capitalists, despite the fact that they now replace the role of the ca capitalists when it comes to management and distribution. The truth is, however, that we are in the middle of this revolution that is occurring and it has not fully been realized. Not to mention that also when the bourgeoisie were replacing the feudal lords, it was not noticeable as this was occurring because it was a very slow process like all revolutions. And it was a, a top-down one too. This is uh, this one is especially slow because it is a world revolution, as capitalism is a global system unlike any other systems we've seen prior. Some evidence of the withdrawal of the big capitalists from production is their participation in high finance and investment. This creates more industry and production and makes the capitalists have more control. However, it is indirect because it is impossible to manage all these new industries, so one needs a more efficient way to do so. Thus, management was delegated to other people because it is more efficient this way. These people begin controlling who has access to and who, and who does not have access to the means of production. The most obvious, obvious example is that of hiring and firing workers. The capitalists have even withdrawn from the economic process entirely and spend their time on beaches and yachts and vacationing, etc. They've kind of checked out in a way. It should be noted that yes, the capitalists do have some power, obviously, as they in some sense still manage the managers and can get rid of rebellious ones. However, the managers will take over as they become more comfortable in their position. They will realize the capitalists are not necessary. Thus, they will be gotten rid of. Now, obviously, the existence of capitalism is contingent upon the existence of a capitalist class as a whole, not some individual capitalists. The question arises that if the current capital capitalists are replaced by managers, won't the managers just become the new capitalists and no longer managers? The reason the answer is no is because under the current conditions of capitalism, one can't build the wealth of the capitalist families. The 60 families have changed very little and have integrated very few new elites. And the inability of the elite to integrate fresh elites is a sign of decadence and stagnation. It should also be noted that the current managers will not uh, be the new elite. It will be over the vast amount of generations where a new managerial elite will come into power. The state in capitalism regulates and protects the interests of the capitalists as they're the lifeblood of the system. But as this governmental organization and management over industry expands, so do the opportunities for managers to have control over industry expand. Lots of young men pursuing a high career work in government bureaucracy is an example of this, as this allows them more control over industry and therefore power. Even the children of the big capitalists may look for uh, positions in government bureaucracy, as it will provide a way to get their power back, or, or at least in some sense maintain it in a new form. Burnham points out that the Leninists often advocate increasing state power under the current rule, despite being against capitalism. This strengthens the capitalists because, in their own view, so long as capitalism exists, the state acts as its enforcer. This goes against the interests of the Leninists, but they advocate it. Capitalists are very clear about their own interests. 
and that they don't want the state to be strengthened insofar as the strengthening encroaches on their ability to make a profit off their enterprise. However, the state and capitalists can work in a symbiotic fashion where the capitalist protects the interests of the sorry, where the state protects the interests of the capitalists and enforces their property ownership, while at the same time the capitalists can generate wealth for the state, which helps aid in its ability to expand its power and reach. When the state does, however, take more control over the capitalist society and regulates the enterprises, especially the means of production, we get this transition from a limited state of capitalism to an unlimited state of managerialism. The breakdown of the managerial society looks like this. Uh, this you know, the state ownership over the means of production, which, by the way, cannot be said to be the same as socialism, as for one, it will not be proletarians in charge of the state, it will be a higher earning, it will just be higher earning employees, aka the managers over production. And secondly, there will be uh, less class distinctions within this society, uh, but there's still, oh, sorry, there will still be class distinctions within this society, so it's not socialist. You cannot call the state capitalist either, as those who own the enterprise uh, are not in power. Rather, the enterprise is put in the hands of the state and managed by the public entity of the state, which is contrary to capitalism. No individuals will have private dominion over the enterprise or have enough money to start their own. You can only call a state capitalist. Uh, you can only call a state a capitalist society, uh, such a thing, when the state owns a small amount of the enterprise and the rest is, and the rest of society is capitalist. The managers will control the state, which in turn control the means of production. And because the managers have access and dominion over the distribution of goods, they get to they get to exploit the classes they rule over and take most of the shares for themselves of the products they manage. By exploitation, we mean that the wealth is distributed unevenly within a society. This exploitation will be different from that of the capitalist, as no one individual or company will exploit its workers. Rather, it will be the governmental and managerial bodies that will. Managers are in a insecure position as they constantly have the risk of getting fired for performing poorly. They can't just simply become capitalists either, as a majority of the funds produced go to the owner of the enterprise. But once capitalism runs dry, as we have established, it will, in this video, we, you know, we can't uh, resolve it with more capitalism, as the instability of capitalism will be replaced by the state-owned uh, means of production of the managerial elite. So, yeah, as capitalism dries out, the, the ownership is going to shift to the state, which is run by the managers. The reason the managers will take over is that they, they are the ones who have the most control over the means of production, and despite the fact they don't own it legally yet, their managers make themselves indispensable. They are a necessary uh, entity. Modern conditions do not allow any other class except the managers to have the potential for power in a society as the private process can no longer push the production process any further. And in the modern economy, the state must step in, thus the manager's part of this uh, yeah, the state must step in, and thus the manager's part of this reason is to do with the constant threat of war as well. Private enterprise fails to take over uh, to take care of the unemployed, whereas the managers are the are the ones in charge of who's employed and who is uh, not employed. Private enterprise can't build infrastructure at, any longer, to, uh, so the state must intervene and do so. Once again, the managerial state is controlled by the managers, obviously, and that state has control over the means of production. This, of course, would mean that capitalist private property rights would be negated if the state controls the means of production. The role of currency will be different, of course. It will be used less as a means of wealth for individual capitalists, and more of a form of trade, such as new um, forms of bartering will occur. Money itself will lose its metallic base more and more. Capitalist-style economic crises will not occur in the managerial society, as these capitalist crises are dependent upon profit-seeking and require capitalists for that, obviously. However, the managerial society will have its own crises, and there will be ones of political and econ economic crises, as the state and economy are united in managerial society. Production will be organized by groups of men and the institutions proper to the state, which organize production, as opposed to a market. Managerialism will have its own problems, of course. It will solve many of the problems of capitalism, but a form of class exploitation will always be present, except this time, by managers. There is the sovereign elite and its institutions, and the institutions can act on their own, so long as they are in accordance with the will of the elite. The institutions are limited in what they do, in that they must conform to the socially correct positions so that they seem in a way legitimate to people. Sovereignty for the capitalists lies in their parliament, 
which helps enforce uh, their power over property rights. But in the managerial society, this will change as nobody will have direct rights over property in the capitalist sense. In these parliaments, however, the majority parties will use their numeric power and often will be the ones who get the job done. In the managerial society, the apparatus used by the ruling class to enforce this desire will shift from the parliaments to bureaus, which are concerned with heavy economic planning. Many would think of this shift from parliament to bureau to be some kind of transition of fascist or communist revolution, revolutionaries. However, this is not the case, as the same process has been going on in America, which is neither of the two, and in fact ideologically opposed to the two. In America, it is said that Congress is the entity that passes the laws, and while this is technically true, the influence of executive organizations and interest groups are becoming more prominent in the influence of lawmaking. The state in capitalism is more limited than a man managerial society, which has its influence, influence in such things as the production of roads and steel mills, etc. The capitalist state simply existed to enforce rights and punish those who broke them, such as uh, thugs or murderers. However, in the managerial state, the law is more influential as being in charge of the production of industry affects more people than punishing uh, you know, law, um, lawbreakers does or, or murderers do. Um, the capitalist state institutions will also change because it will be dis uh, despised by the masses as well, and this will in turn only strengthen the morale of those in power and in, in the new institutions. The bureaus are perfect for the managers as they will provide a barrier against the capitalists and masses who use the parliament to enact their will as it is suited to their kind of need and modes of operation. During the transition period, the capitalists will try to downplay the success of the state, uh, state bureaus that is, and say that they can't do as well as private industry can. The capitalists will even try to find ways to sabotage the bureaus. This makes sense in the capitalist interest as the state expansion is contrary to their ability to make a profit. Uh, Burnham states that the closest nations which have a managerial state at the time of writing this book in 1941 are Germany, Russia, Italy. In essence, two fascist nations uh, and one socialist, quote-unquote socialist. Uh, these are examples of extreme totalitarian regimes, but uh, also are the most managerial. These totalitarian regimes, Bur Burnham says, are the most extreme ones uh, ever seen as they influence every facet of life, art, religion, culture, etc., Technology played a role in this advancement toward totalitarianism, as now communication is easier and transportation is faster, so power can expand faster because of technology. All powers tend to categorize totalitarianism as bad, so long as it's foreign totalitarian, as long as as it is foreign totalitarianism, and not their own totalitarianism, as other totalitarian regimes are a threat to the one to other regimes. For example, the USSR saying National Socialist Germany is evil and totalitarian, but meanwhile, the USSR is also a, a total state, so it's, it's just, that's the idea. A question arises if the government of managerial society are ones of people filled with bureaucrats, such as Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini. Uh, isn't this a bureaucratic elite rather than a managerial elite? Also, is it necessary that the managerial society remain totalitarian? So to answer the second question first, the social position of the lower classes of society will be the same, so it doesn't matter if it's bureaucratic or managerial. Now, the politicians uh, in the regimes of Germany and Russia, etc., are very much similar to managers in their actions and modes of operations. They have the same thought patterns as managers. They also are disciplining masses of people like managers would on a production line, and they often quite try and tell them to produce things during wartime. Their new political ideas are very similar to that of a manager producing a new product on the assembly line as well. The capitalist ruling elite were separate from the state. They were a private enterprise, and their state just supported them. In the managerial society, since the political and the economical are united, the state is stronger. The elite will have their place of operation in the state, and some capitalists will become managerial elite themselves and be absorbed into the new class. The politicians of society who are the ones organizing warfare, propaganda, etc., are not the same as managers, but they will be uh, guided by the managers who are above them. They also must be seen as legitimate by the masses for the managers to utilize them efficiently in the state, and they need to, they need to be accepted in order to mobilize the masses. So they need to trust, basically. Uh, it is also the case 
that the managers, of course, will have the majority of wealth, as in the most managerial society, such as Russia, those who control the big farms and industry get the largest share, and these, of course, are the managers in the state. There will, of course, be conflict in the managerial society, like all new societies have, and even conflict between managers. Burnham answers this question of the managerial society. Um, Burnham answers this question of will the managerial society remain totalitarian by first defining democracy as a political system where policy is decided by the majority, and where the minority have the opportunity to become the majority in terms of being able to decide policy. There has never been a 100% fully democratic society. Only degrees of democracy in a society. Because if it were fully democratic, this would be unstable and society could not last. Often children, women, and those of certain heritage, heritages, sorry, fucking fuck that up, <laughs> um, are excluded from making decisions as well as, uh, you know, this is seen in the Athenian democracy. Uh, there were limitations of those who could have influence. Basically, if you weren't a Greek citizen, you couldn't vote or whatever. Uh, in America, it was, you know, racial minorities and whatever. Uh, if managerial society is democratic, it will be in and of itself of its own distinct democracy from all others. During the transition periods, the society uh, tends to become more totalitarian as they need to put things in place and organize a new society. But over time, when this new organization becomes less necessary, it tends to settle down. Managerial society will start out as a totalitarian and then become more democratic. As in order for the managers to organize society, they must do so from the standpoint of central planning. And in terms of economics, they must need some form of democracy so that way they can have an idea of what it is to produce, of what to produce, and see what people want and what their needs are, and make sure society remains stable. The political machine uh, must know the state of mind of the people in order that they don't miscalculate in their analysis of the people, which they use to organize the people around. In other words, they must let the people express themselves in some way so they know their interests and they know uh, what they will, what they can use to appeal to in keeping their legitimacy. Also, letting the masses have some limited form of democracy allows them to feel as if they have power when they actually don't, but this feeling will keep them tamed, which is important. As if they didn't have this feeling, they'd probably leave, leave to more social unrest and maybe another revolution. Um, however, managerial societies... Uh, may never end up being democratic, as since the managerial society tends to be the first totalitarian, at first totalitarian, and the nature of managerial society is a state-run economy. And this makes it very hard for opposition groups to form as all private institutions are negated by the state, and thus you have a one-party state. Different sectors of industry can provide this uh, basis as they are all being run by one entity, and perhaps workers, worker cooperatives and syndicates could be the basis for this. But with a heavily advanced and centralized state, it would be much easier to stamp these out. Moving on to managerial society and world policy, Burnham points out that if all nations uh, are sovereign, that is having the ability to govern themselves and set their own laws uh, without having any uh, lawgiver above them, this creates a world anarchy. Just as, just as if, if all individuals govern themselves and nobody had control over them, this would also create anarchy in the ideological sense. Burnham predicts the attempt at a global, one-state managerial government to take over, that this would eliminate global anarchy. However, he says that a one-world state is unlikely, as this ironically becomes much too difficult to manage and maintain for the managers. The first being the technical difficulties of this project of organizing the whole world under a single rule, and the job is just too big to ever fully complete. How would this managerial empire generate a, you know, a police, a military system, to police the whole world as well. You know, th this project would presuppose a unity amongst men also in the different nations, which when considering the diversity of the world is not possible, and which has never been historically. And you can you can kind of see this trying to happen right now, obviously, with the mass immigration. Uh, but anyway, uh, at the same uh, in re going back to that, in regards to the managerial process occurring, they're trying to synthesize all these people. You could maybe argue that. At the same time, the capitalist system of a of multiple sovereign nations is collapsing. So what's going to take its place? Well, this is going to be replaced by large nations or super states or, uh, or blocks. There may be old nations still remaining the same within them. However, they will be stripped of sovereignty and replaced by super states. The power blocks will most likely be Northwestern Europe, Japan, and the United States. These power blocks will be uh, built through wars as all systems of this kind are generated via warfare. 
We can now understand, according to Burnham, the meaning of the Great World Wars. The first in 1914, uh, World War I, that is, being the final capitalist or bourgeoisie state war, um, and the second in 1939 being the managerial uh, state world war. 1914 is being selected as a starting point at the end of the capitalist state wars, as this war fermented the Russian Revolution for the first great leap toward managerial society, as well as the dissolution of the British Empire, which dominated Europe and also the rest of the world. The aftermath of World War I showed that the capitalist world system could no longer function as it became too unstable. These blocks will rule their own uh, domains, and the wars that make them up will be fought by conquering regions and implementing a new power there. Once established, these blocks will be concerned with how much they get to rule and influence uh, they have over the rest of the world. No solution among geographic lines will be made as these lines will be disregarded and power will simply seek to expand for its own sake. The managerial wars will be uh, between those of power blocks seeking to be the most dominant. There will also be wars against the backward and less developed peoples from more developed metropo and more. Well, there will be wars against less developed people from more developed peoples. What he's saying: these backward peoples cannot defend themselves as they are less advanced militarily and will have to gravitate toward another competing power block. They also can't use their economics as their uh, economics are weak in comparison. The capitalists can no longer colonize these backward nations as such in Latin America as it is no longer profitable to them and their interests overall. So the managerial state will take its place as it is more suited for the managers to do this job. The capitalist system has lost its energy and thus dying out. Now Burnham switches to talking about the ideologies of the managerial society. As mentioned previously, all societies tend to have an ideology which unites them together, and this is the cement that keeps people united socially. These ideologies, in order to work, do not have to be true. They must simply appeal to the people and the elite at the same time in order that the elite and their institutions remain in power and that the people feel as if they're being accounted for. That's why democracy is used as an elite weapon, as it can help bolster the elite and help quell the masses. It can't be a vague appeal either. It must actually appeal to their own particular interests at the time. The old ideologies of capitalism no longer move people out or make them want to fight any longer. This is why nationalist Germany was so successful, as it first appealed to the people's interests, even in their enemy's land, which they occupied. They weren't motivated enough by capitalism to fight the German nationalists, and the people chose national socialism over capitalism, as it appealed to their interests more than capitalism became, uh, so, so more than capitalism, which became stagnant. So when old ideologies die out, new ones take their place. Ultimately, through ultimately though, since society is becoming more managerial, uh, managerial ideologies will win as they know um, what to appeal to. In the capitalist societies, uh, we saw freedom and rights as the basis for ideologies. And in the co uh, communist ideologies, we saw labor and the proletarian rights as a basis. And now we see order, discipline, and people as a new basis in the managerial ideologies. Burnham clarifies what he means by Leninist Stalinism being a managerial ideology and Marxism not. Uh, it is true, both spring from Marxism, but Lenin Leninism and Stalinism had a reformist wing which cooperated with capitalist nations. But what makes this ideology managerial is the fact that the state existed and classes still existed under it, and it in no way fulfilled the promises of Marx. Class distinction was present, a state was present, and it was not fully democratic whatsoever. The capitalists also uh, loosely able to identify... Um, that of Italian fascism, National Socialism, Stalinism, and New Dealism are all opposed to them uh, and their interests. So this shows that they are in some sense reflective of the managerial trend. Managerial methods of party organization are much more tactile and strong uh, than the capitalist methods of doing so. Both fascism and communism offer a justification for a managerial elite. In fascism, it is more explicit that a strong vanguard uh, defend and lead the nation. In communism, this rationalization is more implicit in that they claim under the capitalist system the masses are not educated enough to organize and revolt, so they need a vanguard to help them uh, this way, and this is how the managerial party elites are formed. One must not simply look at the words spoken by those subscribing to a particular ideology, one must also look at their actions. Some further proof, proof that the World War II ideologies were more managerial was that Hitler and Stalin, was the Hitler and Stalin Pact, which demonstrates the two enemies uniting briefly to combat the capitalist system. 
New Dealism as a managerial ideology is unique in that it is the softest of all managerial ideologies and still doesn't recognize itself as such. And in fact, it is often quick to proclaim it is, it is fidelity to capitalism. It is, however, more managerial than past American society in that government plays a larger role in the development of infrastructure and providing goods for the people of a nation. The discourse in American politics has shifted away from appealing to free enterprise to appealing to the working man and the managers. This is what Franklin Roosevelt often did himself to win votes. Also, it must be noted during this time, appealing to the free market ideas and in industry is not as successful as appealing to order and stability because people value order and stability more than anything. This here demonstrates the decay of capitalist ideology. Technocracy is also another ideology that appealed, but is less of a social effect than New Dealism. A question arises uh, if all these ideologies are the same as New Dealism, Stalinism, and Fascism, National Socialism, etc., how can they possibly be quarreling with one another? Well, the answer is that they are all not the same, but they all share one aspect in that they are all managerial. What distinguishes them is the fact that they appeal to different values and power structures seek to expand and maintain uh, their sovereignty by appealing to uh, different distinct and diverse values. The ideologies differ, but they are managerial, which is what matters. They, have, um, they all have that shared aspect of opposition to the old capitalist way of things. The managers will use socialism and nationalism in order to spread their class rule, and revolutions will occur under these differing ideological trends. The managers have in mind three goals. One, to crush the capitalist elite. Two, to prevent the society from being classless so they will be on top as a managerial class. And three, to take the spoils of society to themselves. Of course, like all revolutions, a new elite will use the masses as a tool for their goals. In Russia, the first managerial state, uh, the process of managerialism goes like this. One, the reduction of the capitalist class to impotence or uselessness in the home nation. Two, the subordination of the masses slowly over time to the new managerial elite. Three, direct geopolitical competitiveness with other managerial states to come, such as Germany. Some of the issues with the managerial social state of Russia was the fact that the worker control that means production would not actually work since you need someone to organize workers accordingly, and thus this is why a managerial elite was needed for them as well. Um, in Russia, you had brief worker control, but this can't work as if we appeal here to uh, Michelle's hierarchy. Uh, it, it is inherent uh, to organization that hierarchy is present. And without it, uh, you can't mobilize as the masses can't rule themselves. They must be organized from without. The same applies to Russia. They had worker control very briefly, but this didn't last for the, for the reasons mentioned. And then committees formed of specialists to help organize and then those committees dissolved into a managerial elite. Even Lenin himself uh, said there needed to be a managerial elite and a dictatorship of the factory. Workers' control usually occurs in times of crises, but this, but this once again doesn't last long, and the Russian state would justify the shift toward managerialism through saying that there is no reason to fight uh, the state and that uh, the state is the state of the workers creating a socialist utopia. This is their way of quelling the masses. Some say Russia has re uh, reverted to capitalism in the, uh, in the latter USSR, but this isn't the case, as uh, there is no private industry and no profit-seeking institutions. It isn't socialism either, as class distinctions uh, still existed and were not fully democratic. Russia is managerial as the state owned the means of production, class distinctions still existed, and the nation was ruled over those who managed the production of industry. Russia was as close to socialism in the first stages once again in the revolution when workers had control over production, but this didn't last long as industry needed to centralize in order to be more productive. A note here should be added that we can never return back to capitalism, as it has run its course and has done its job. It can no longer make use of the resources we have now, so managerialism takes over. Burnham now talks about Germany, and he starts off by saying that 1940s Germany cannot be called nihilistic since it was an organized society, and no organized society can be called such a thing, as organized society uh, must presuppose a unifying set of beliefs in order for it to be coherent and work. There have been two views about Nazi Germany, the one being that it is a form of capitalist society or that it is a new form of society. However, most have not been specific about what this new form actually is. There is also the critique that from the Marxists that the NSDAP is capitalism in decay, but this uh, position presupposes that the only alternative to capitalism is socialism. And this presupposition is unfounded and false, as we, as we have demonstrated. This is simply a lazy way of thinking. The capitalists were not fond of national socialism. 
either as uh, the uh, Social Democratic Party of Germany in competition with the NSDAP was tied to the capitalist state already. It was grandfathered in, in a way. So it was in the capitalist interest to support the competing party, as even though they placed restrictions on enterprise, they still helped keep them in power. A very large proof that Nazi Germany was not capitalist was uh, its ability, even after a brutal world war, to wipe out unemployment. And this is something capitalist society has never been able to do, as they can't manage the masses. We saw that in capitalist nations at the same time, such as England, unemployment was still a major issue. All of this fixing of unemployment was done via state intervention and not capitalist methods of uh, um, of organization. Germany also uh, should have gone completely bankrupt, but they didn't, and this was because they broke through the laws of capitalism, and this was done by simply not playing the capitalist game. Uh, this was because of the, the state-controlled finance, basically. Germany and her ability to conquer new territory was seen as a sign of decline. But if anything, the opposite is true. When a civilizational decline occurs, it is usually the splitting up of states, not the expansion, as a weak elite cannot expand. When compared to the capitalist nations, Germany lacked resources, and despite this, they were able to produce highly advanced weapons of war in very fast amounts of time. And they were also able to generate mass support and a strong virile national and ethnic spirit that cannot occur, that cannot occur during decadence. Only cynical behavior occurs during periods of decadence. This is even expanded outside the nation in what is called their fifth columns. Some may expand, uh, some may object rather, uh, and say that in Nazi Germany private enterprises still exist. And while this is true, the owners of the enterprises are not as liberty to do as much with their enterprise as they did, were able to do previously. The state moderates and controls what they produce and where they and where they purchase materials from, and uh, they're not allowed on their own to negotiate prices and wages. They can't seek profit for profit's sake, as the nation comes first, and they also don't control their investments. They are only owners in the, in the name at the end of the day. It, is, it also does not make sense to call Nazi Germany a war economy. In countries such as the United States, France, and England, uh, not war economies. All nations are preparing for war because they care about security, and Nazi Germany is only said to be a war economy as it has been the most efficient as what it, as what it, at what it does. Because of uh, its managerial nature, of course. Its managerialism allows it to produce faster uh, than less managerial states. Since war in the modern age has become total war, which is to say war by more totalitarian means, and encompassing more individuals than previous eras, it also means society is changing, as when war changes, the war-making institutions also change. However, picking war as the definitive example of Nazi Germany is arbitrary, as one can just as easily call Nazi Germany a housing economy, they built two million homes, or railroad or airplane economy. It must also be stated that because managerial society is uh, more effective at war and power exp and expansion, the cap capitalist nations will be forced to adopt the managerial style of society if they as nations want to survive, or else they will be outmatched. The difference between the German way and the Russian way is that the Russian way, the capitalists are wiped out quickly and not assimilated and forced to bend their will to the new economy and political system. The German way wipes them out slowly and often will take the capitalists and assimilate them into the managerial state, or sector rather. The Germany of 1933 is the first stage of the managerial shift and will also become a major part of the coming European power bloc focus on industry, which uh, we see Germany playing a big role in the European Union today. Uh, the U United States is no different, and the, the capitalist society is slowly diminishing, albeit slower because capitalist sentiments are still present here in America. The capitalists are handing more and more control over to the managers and, al and almost play no role in the process, not only of production, but of business. They no longer monitor production and have moved on to finance, but even here their role is becoming less pronounced. They are putting directors in charge of meetings instead of themselves, more and more uh, territory of the capitalist is being lost. They're losing control. Those, and remember here, those who have control are the ones who have power at the end of the day. We have the New Deal, which is a shift toward managerialism. The New Deal, the New Deal surpasses uh, FDR as an individual who merely used it. This New Dealism sprang forth from within society, such as the men running government bureaucracy and expanding its influence. Many are anti-capitalist, but are also Marxist. However, they don't have faith in the masses to lead toward a social and political revolution creating the Marxist ideal. In the United States, things like agriculture and big business became under the control 
of the state more than it used to be. Uh, import and export regulations became more prominent. Money left its metallic base and became more abstract than before. Overall, capitalist private property rights became less and less powerful as the state subdued them. The progression of the New Deal is only a form of progressivism in the sense that it is progress towards managerialism. The managerial, uh, as well as undermining the power of capitalist institutions, also quells the masses by trying uh, any by tying any popular organizations to the state, aka the managers. In other words, to stop the spread of populist movements, left or right, the managers absorb the populist institutions into the state, aka the managerial class, in order to negate their power. This is a common elite tactic, by the way. Further confirmation that the New Deal was managerial was the fact that so many capitalists did not support Roosevelt. Marxists try to escape this ad, ad hoc by saying that they didn't know their own interests well enough to be against them. The truth is that the capitalists are opposed to it because it is truly opposed to their interests uh, as is the state imposing itself on private enterprise. American power has three stages, the first being the destruction of continental European power. Next is the consolidation of power in the Atlantic uh, around uh, the South American regions. Next, next and final stage will be American dominance globally, especially over Asia and the like. America will try and take over globally, as all super states will try and do. However, this will fail. As mentioned previously, the project is just too large and too complex. Other super states will also be competing as well, so this makes it a, a major barrier. Today, we can kind of see that with places like China and Russia. Um, but anyway, more more uh, modern total war is not profitable uh, because to the capitalist, total war is controlled by and produced by uh, by a larger state, which manages the war machine and needs very little assistance from private enterprise. Much of the production of warfare materials are done by the managers of the state utilizing private industry as its host, but nonetheless still managed and controlled by the state. So you could have these private industries, but they, are they really private in the sense that the state is really utilizing them? This is why World War I was the last capitalist war as it marks a shift toward a total war, which is in nature more managerial. The managerial shift in America is similar to Germany, as both already have advanced industry, a managerial class, and, an, and more advanced culture. Russia lacked all these things, as historically they lagged behind. The differences between America and Germany are that Germany has gotten rid of its capitalist classes quicker because the capitalist ideologies are not as prominent. Once again, the steps to the managerial revolution are the reduction of the capitalists, uh, curbing of the masses, and the competition with other sectors of the managers at once as it is using the method of war uh, to conquer and be dominant, which requires fast movement. And don't forget, as a rule, war always uh, speeds up the process of social change, as the whole of society is now oriented towards the war effort in the new national and new national self-consciousness arises. There will never be a backward trend for managerialism towards capitalism. As the managers are in power, they will not allow this. During the managerial revolution, the masses will be displeased as the class of society uh, they will, as they as they want, they will not come about. Furthermore, the managers will use socialism as a tool to get the masses on their side, but this will be a cheap trick to maintain power. I also want to mention here, and I should have put this in, in the notes, is that you know they're not they also are not going to revert back to capitalism because you're going to have there's going to be more power underneath the managerial society. The state is more total. You're going to have more influence. So it's better to be a managerial elite than a capitalist elite, as you are more powerful. So now Burnham addresses some object objections to this theory. One critique of uh, the managerial revolution is that the revolution will not be of the managers, but of the bureaucrats, in a more narrow sense, the politicians who run the state and the police and military. The issue with this is that this only accounts for a minority of the ruling class, as we have established. Those who rule or have dominion over the means of production will be the ruling class, as they are necessary for having power and privilege. Once a new class rules over the means of production, the state bureaucracy will have to move with this elite in order to defend their, the managerial elites, dominion over the means of production. So the reason it's not going to be a bureaucratic revolution is simply because the bureaucrats do not have control over the means of production which deter and who which determines the ruling class. It's the managers who have control over the, the means of production which makes them uh, the new elite. So that's the key to understanding that. Because that can be confusing and I understand why people could mistake that. Um, the managers are also more dominant at current time as they permeate both governmental organizations and private institutions. So they're, they're everywhere to begin with. Just to remind everyone here, uh, the managers are people like uh, directing engineers, technocrats, and propagandists, production executives, etc. 
These exist both in the private and state spaces. Thus, a bureaucratic class will most likely synthesize with its managerial with, with the managerial, as they already have more influence other than them in overall social affairs. The Marxist criticism of the theory is that while the managerial class may replace the capitalists, uh, the destruction of private property is not enough, as they will utilize nationalist governments to establish power, and this nationalism will be more potent than forms of capitalist variants. Well, this criticism doesn't prove much. It just states that the destruction of the current social life is coming, uh, and not in, in this, no, no way at all does this demonstrate uh, socialism, which is once again a classless and fully democratic society. That doesn't prove that at all. The nationalism used by the managers is a device for social cohesion and unity, which is essential to any uh, strong state. The USSR itself uses this in its appeal to the workers, etc., at least in the USSR, but also during World War II with Stalin, uh, appealing to Russian nationalism. Capitalist nationalism proposes small states, easier to avoid control of the state, I'd imagine, is the reason. Uh, and in the managerial society, it will be replaced by super states, which are often totalitarian ones. This Marxist critique amounts to saying, this is not socialism, socialism, um, which doesn't disprove the theory, but, uh, you know, it, it's just doesn't, that's not a, an argument against the theory. Oh, well, this is not socialism, so it's not going to happen. Well, this uh, destruction of civilization um, is, is going to just be a transition into a new civilization. Also, this critique uh, presupposes, once again, that socialism is the only alternative to capitalism, which is has thus far been unjustified by the Marxists. Another critique is that if people want peace and freedom, they will sweep out the managers. And this is true. This can only occur uh, if that is what the people want, and they know how to get it, and are willing to do so. So all three of those things must be the case. They know what they want, they know how to get it, and they're willing to do it. However, in all the case studies, Germany, uh, Italy, Russia, uh, we see people are more willing to aid the managers than fight against them. This is seen in the fact that the managers push ideologies which people adopt that support them, and also that, naturally speaking, people like to be led. So that there con concludes our reading of James Burnham's uh, The Managerial Revolution. I hope you found some value in this, and um, definitely read the book. We're going to be doing more elite. Uh, we're going to be doing more reviews of elite theory books, and yeah, thanks again.